it, 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 it is, uh, as always, of course, uh, with, with all else, it is a pleasure to have to, to, to have them come and uh, give us a talk. Um, but with Mike, it's particular pleasure because uh, he is actually an old-time Londoner, really, and then he finally found himself back home. That's the way I see it, anyway. Um, <coughs> Back home here at the Bartlett, um, he, he he was professor at Manchester University Town Planning, um, and has now uh, you, you, there's no way you can see the time we have it, um, but has now joined us. Uh, I've got I'm just going to read out, so I don't really know some of these details. I think they were born in Glasgow. Um, you won't say how old you are because it's the same age as me, and that doesn't flatter anyone. Modern <laughs> 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 uh, history. Merton College, um, doctorate in geography, Reading. Um, well, we could, you know, talk about age. I mean, people still go to Dr. He was your tutor, Peter Hall was your tutor. And I guess I remember the first time we met Mike was actually in books where my brother used to teach, so we, we, we sort of uh, remember that very much. So, um, And there's no doubt about it that um, Mike is one of the specialists on London planning, um, and, and in that regard, you know, it's a privilege to have him as a colleague. And he has spent a, um, some extensive time on the design review panel for London Crossrail. And uh, given that this is, I understand, is it the, big, the biggest mega project in Europe? So I, that, that's what the claims are. Because we do everything big here in the UK now. Um, it's a new generation project. So <laughs> bloody uh, <coughs> expensive to tunnel under London. Oh, well, that's right. Uh, but the rewards are at the end. So, Mike, welcome. Um, and the, the topic, as you've gathered by now, from the Circus London Crossrail Mega Project is Keyhole surgery, surgery. I'm not sure how that one works, but you can perhaps explain that to, to me. Um, very quickly, if you wouldn't mind, we'd go around the room. If you could just look at your, your name, um, which country you're from, or which department, or which course you're on, just so we get some idea. Um, um, I'm Dominic Lundcommon. I'm a Senior Transport Development Officer and Strategy at Essex County Council. And I'm Dan Wally. Uh, I approve of HMRC, but that's not a lot of uh, so. I'm James Hodgson, Undergraduate Geography at the University of Cambridge. And we're from Tom Tanner, and uh, I'm from uh, Boulder Earth with Professor Pandy. Uh, Chris from China, we're back by the students. Um, yes, in China, um, Master's student in Macai. I'm Carlos Torrente from Colombia, with a Master in Mega Infrastructure. Hello, I'm Sam McCoy. I'm a uh, Professor of Research Fellow at Imperial College, uh, and I'm from Australia originally. Okay. Uh, I'm Alice, I'm from France, and I'm doing the Urban Studies course. Uh, Marco Dean, I'm from Italy and I am a, a research assistant of the Omega Center. I'm Jane, I'm, I'm, I'm come from South Korea and I'm doing my PhD course here. I'm Andrew Harris, I teach geography and urban studies here at UCL. I am John Ward from the Omega Center. I'm Laura Barton from the uh, Royal Institute of Charter today as well a journal editor. Uh, I'm Lisa Kusuma, I'm from Indonesia, I'm currently a Hello, my name is Maud, I'm uh, from Canada, and I'm a master's degree student in uh, Macau. Uh, John Kelsey, lecturer in construction project management, of course, director for the MSC in construction and economics. I'm Naima, originally from China, but I'm a senior lecturer in development at unit which is part of the Bible School. I directed a master course in early Robin Hirsch, uh, I'm, I'm Irish, uh, <laughs> educated in France and uh, Germany. Um, and uh, I've been at uh, Imperial College uh, since we founded the Railway and Transport Centre in 1992. Oh, Robin. Uh, I'm Hannah, I'm doing a PhD in archaeology. Okay. Okay, well, future archaeologists of London will find some very, very large holes in the ground. <laughs> and uh, that's what I'm talking about, is the digging of those holes. Um, 
Mega infrastructure is as key health surgery. Uh, wherever you go in London now, you encounter the disruption of a major construction project. What's it about? Well, as you know, we're celebrating 150 years of the first underground line in London, and the purpose of that underground line was to connect the terminals of the main line stations, which come in from all points of the compass, but as they were coming into an already expanded city centre, uh, they had to park themselves on the edge of the built-up area for complicated reasons to do with the land ownership pattern in London. London was very difficult to penetrate. And so London was faced with a problem of joining up the dots of the mainline railway stations. And that is a, is a perennial puzzle. Here are mainline terminals, the heavy rail terminals, and they're distributed in a more or less circular shape around the city and west end of London. And how do we connect these stubs of the national rail network? Well, the first solution, exactly 150 years ago, was to build the Metropolitan Railway Line, which connects Paddington via Euston and King's Cross and rumbles along just outside our doorstep here. And it's worth remembering that when the Metropolitan Line was first created, it ran broad gauge, carrying the rolling stock of the Great Western Railway um, and taking that round to Farrington. And then the Circle Line was completed as a, as a loop in 1884, and it joins up all but two of the termini, really, everything except London Bridge and Waterloo is within easy distance of the Circle Line station. It was fully electrified by 1905, except last weekend, as you probably realise, there was this wonderful um, historical reenactment of running a steam train along the, uh, the uh, Metropolitan Line. But nevertheless, the Circle Line was a rather slow and awkward way of joining the dots. And so, right from the late 19th century onwards, there was discussion about improved methods of connecting the main line terminal. For example, in 1896, the London County Council recommended that any future underground links should be built at 16-foot bore. In other words, so that the tunnels were big enough to take um, uh, rail, national, um, heavy rail. And there was a continuing debate, why should London have, as so many German cities have, a Hauptbahnhof, a Grand Union station, a new station in Trafalgar Square, say, to which all the railway lines would feed together. Well, that debate, continued throughout the early years of the 20th century. But I'm going to leap and really start my narrative in 1943 with a famous plan produced by the celebrated planner who earlier had done the plan behind Andrew's head there, which is Sir Patrick Abercrombie, former professor of town planning at the Bartlett School of University College London. So, somebody with whom we feel we have some ancestral bonds. Um, but his famous County of London plan, 1943, proposed that consideration be given to a new cross-London rail infrastructure. And after the war, in fact, in the final years of the war, the Railway London Plan Committee was appointed to consider how to achieve this and it reported in 1948. Um, and that was the year that the British Transport Commission was created, which brought together all the main railway companies in a single nationalised body with the London Transport Report. And their report in 1949 could be taken to 
give us the origins of modern crossrail. 1949, the year of, well, Harry and I were two. And <laughs> we'll be in the coffin before trains are running, but anyway, never mind. Um, so here, here, let's start the story, let's start the narrative with the London Railways Band of 1949. Proposal for, th and I, the reason I'm telling you this long narrative is it brings home the, the planning, the long planning lead time for mega projects, or, or at least not, not all mega projects, but this mega project in particular has had a very tortuous gestation, a very tortuous birth. Uh, which helps to explain some of its present characteristics. That's the structure of my talk. So, 34 miles of large bore tunnel, and specifically designed for something very much like modern crossrail. Ten carriage trains, ample seats, sliding doors, trains that would go right through London. And here are some of the, lo the links that they proposed. Um, and they assessed these various routes. Now, none of them were built. Uh, no new line between Euston and Blackfriars, no new connection between Cambridge and Victoria, no linking of London Bridge with the Euston line at Neasden, no connection between Fenchurch Street and Waterloo. None of these proposals left the drawing board. The only one that did was their line D, linking the Cambridge lines via Tottenham Hale with Victoria. And that was built in the 1960s, after the, it was the first mega project to be subjected to a cost-benefit analysis in this country. And it was opened in 1969 as the Victoria Line. But that was a conventional deep tunnel tube line with a narrow bore. It wasn't at all, in any sense, a, a cross-rail route. Let's move the clock forward um, to the 1960s, the election of a Labour government which looked at London's rail problems, the working party of the Passenger Transport Committee. This was at a time of outward spread of commuters and they analysed this in some detail. They recommended a new underground line and various tube extensions but no new heavy rail investment underneath London. And in fact, they were very pessimistic about the prospects for heavy rail in London. This was at a time of the Buchanan Report, Traffic in Towns, at a time when the primary road network was on the drawing board, at a time when all the trend forecasts were of rising motorisation and surplus rail capacity. This at a time when the Rail commuting in London was actually declining steeply, an 8% drop just in those seven years. And remember, this was the proposal for the redevelopment of Fitzrovia. This is Tottenham Court Road. And this tangle of, motor of motorways is what Colin Buchanan in this report, Traffic in Towns, envisaged as being um, a potential transport solution to the problems of London. So, transport investment in this period of the late 60s was being channeled into the mo proposals for a motorway box, ringways, and radial motorways. This was confirmed by a study carried out by the Department of Transport and the Metropolitan Council in 1968, the London Transportation Study, which was the first large-scale application of American land use transport methodology to a British city. And it included a Plan G, two mainline tubes linking through central London with a major in interchange under Covent Garden, Paddington to Liverpool Street, London Bridge to Victoria. And what's fascinating, here we've got the roots of them, the analysis predicted the benefit of an increase of 1% in peak hour public transport trips. Estimated annual rate of return, 2%, as against the motorway box prediction of 8.8%. So, again, all the focus of decision making was on building motorways, equipping London with a modern highway system. 
That was the future. Until 1973, when Labour won control of the GRC on a platform, no more urban motorways. And at exactly the same time in Toronto and in San Francisco and in uh, which other cities switched from urban motorway construction at just that moment, early 1970s, as one other famous example. Well, I suppose the Manhattan West Side motorway was abandoned at that stage as well. Yeah. So, Peter Hall says of that moment, the world was stood on its head. So suddenly from the late 1970s, rail solutions came back onto the agenda. And the following year, the London Rail Study was undertaken. This was a joint committee of central government and the uh, London government. Technical team led by David Baylis using uh, very innovative forecasting and um, evaluation techniques. It acknowledged that rail was a declining sector, but it looked, it tested growth scenarios based on rail investment. Remember, there had been no rail investment in central London from the First World War up until the building of the Victoria Line. Um, and the network had been extended in all directions, but the centre was still essentially a pre-First World War network. So this is what they looked at, and they also said, if we invest in rail, we should couple this with congestion charging and with measures to revive the downtown economy of London. Um, and they looked at various schemes, which I won't go into, into in detail, but among them was a proposal for two cross-rail lines, one from Paddington to Liverpool Street and the other from Victoria to London Bridge which they described as an imaginative and exciting solution to the problems of overcrowded public transport in central London. They're jolly good lines. Actually, this is a wonderful scheme um, with a big interchange at Leicester Square, Covent Garden, and a big interchange at Holborn and <coughs> France. And what does that remind you of? You French educated or French oh, educated? Yes. Yeah. This was at a time when the Paris Ariel was under construction. It was due to open in 1976. Um, Hamburg and Munich were also building their s -bar. So this was at a time when other European cities were already underway with cross-rail investment. And what's actually extraordinary is how the Ariel Linie A, the red line, is identical in almost all respects to Crossrail as we're now building it. It's the same length, it's the same number of stations, it's the same length of tunnel uh, under, under the central city, it's the same frequency of trains, and it's the same projected capacity. So it's a remarkable uh, parallel in all respects except for the fact that it was built 40 years earlier. Um, so, um, that was the proposal as it came through from the London Rail study. And then rather strangely, another very different proposal came through from British Rail. The British, the National Railway Network had been studying cross-rail options. It published its ideas in 1980 with a foreword by the chairman, Sir Peter Parker, who hailed this as demonstrating that the, the British Rail British Rail is capable of innovatory thinking and can reason expansively, constructively, and at a high technical level in bad times as well as good. What could he mean by bad times? Well, I'll come to that in a minute. But here was the report. Here, in a very simple cartoon form, is an illustration of the concept of the scheme through railway running in London. And here is a wonderful illustration at this, the time when they were experimenting with the advanced passenger train which was Britain's pioneering pendolino, um, which can still be seen in the sidings of crew, um, but which was withdrawn from service after a tragically short life because the tilting mechanism made the passengers seasick. 
I got this wrong. <laughs> it seems such an extraordinary story. But at any rate, here was the proposal for essentially north-south crossrail coming out from Euston and King's Cross and plunging down to Victoria and Waterloo. And here we have an advanced passenger train, obviously having pelted down from Glasgow, and it's arrived at East Croydon Station. You see, so this is the vision of the future. But it's a vision which didn't come because why these were bad times. These were really bad times to be thinking constructively and expansively about rail investment. Why? Why? Election. Yes, thank you very much. Exactly so. So Mrs. Thatcher was in power. Mrs. Thatcher hated rail, mm. and it was the worst possible time to be proposing major expansion of the rail infrastructure under London. But Mrs. Thatcher was actually responsible for the eventual project that we now have before us. Why? Because of Big Bang, and because of the deregulation of the banks, and the upturn of the financial services sector, which brought back employment to central London and revived in a very dramatic way the central London labour market, with all that implied in terms of commuting demand. And shortly after the abolition of the Greater London Council, which was another of her achievements, the London boroughs carried out a rail study. So London had no metropolitan authority, but the 33 boroughs in a joint committee were wrestling with the problems, the increasing problems, of travel-to-work access in the London labour market. And so, in this context of globalisation and Big Bang, the upturn in the labour market, the beginning of Docklands development, the sharp increase in passenger miles, 18, 1982 to 1990, a 70% increase, practically doubled the number of passengers. And um, so there was a problem, a problem of uh, limited capacity and excess demand. Colin Buchanan was commissioned to uh, look at this. And it was interesting, it's a very fascinating report, because they praised what they called the brilliant opportunism of Michael Heseltine, who had announced the Docklands Light Railway at a Conservative Party conference without uh, any backing from the Secretary of State for Transport, and <laughs> paid for it out of the Department of the Environment budget, or half of it. So it was a, an extraordinary political stroke. But the, Colin Buchanan praised this as demonstrating that it took uh, that sort of degree of verve and nerve to meet the crisis of London's um, uh, transport. And they hailed the Docklands Light Railway as demonstrating not only the way in which rail investment can trigger development in the right place, but also the fact that it's something that developers are prepared to pay for, which the French had already discovered in Paris. Um, and so, consequently, they revived the idea of a cross-rail investment in London. And these were the options they looked at. They looked at the possibility of a, what they call a water pool line linking Liverpool Street to Waterloo, or a Clapham pool line linking Liverpool Street to Clapham Junction, or a Liverpad line joining Liverpool Street to Paddington, joining the dots, or a King Vic line running from King's Cross to Victoria, and, best of all, a Padaloopool line, <laughs> <laughs> which would, they call the catch-all solution, which would run from Liverpool Street down to Waterloo, then across to Victoria, and then back up to Pad Absolutely inspired, you have to agree. Um, wonderful concept. Um, so, there it is. Um, well, now this was an advisory <coughs> report to the London boroughs. It was taken forwards by the Central London Rail Study in 1989, which was an extremely serious piece of work um, between the Department of Transport, London Underground, and British Rail. And it looked again at all these options. 
By this stage, the Jubilee Line had already been signed off, so it was under construction. But the Secretary of State acknowledged to Parliament that the trends of travel demand was such that even when this enormous and fabulous new line was built, there would still be the need for further investment. So Central London Rail study in 1989, I'm sorry this is a protracted narrative, but I think that's part of the interest of it, looked at two options, or four options altogether, East-West Crossrail, Chelsea Hackney Line, North-South Crossrail, East-South, and it subjected all of them to a cost-benefit analysis, narrowed it down with treasury assistance for two options, East-West Crossrail, cost-benefit ratio of 1.32, Chelsea Hackney Line, cost benefit ratio of 1.29. And so the recommended option was an east west crossrail, a crossrail that would come in at Paddington and would go out at Liverpool Street. And consequently, a crossrail bill was presented to Parliament in 1993. There was a lot of debate about the problems of building a railway line under London concern over the environmental impact, the construction disruption, the damage to historic fabric. Interestingly, Michael Portillo, who subsequently has done a television series about the joys of rail travel, was Secretary to the Treasury, and it was arguably he who stuck the dagger between the ribs of the Crossrail Bill. Certainly, Prime Minister John Major was lukewarm, and the bill was voted out by Parliament at the committee stage in 1994. So having got, at long last, a proposal for Crossrail onto the statute book, it, it was voted out of Parliament in 1994. Isn't it worth pointing out that in 1994 we were just coming out of a recession as well, which may have had a contribution towards Mr. Portaloo's uh, Yes. Feelings. Well, that's true, but of course we're always, yes, I mean, this is a good argument for sort of counter-cyclical, I mean, well, I mean probably just the moment. 1993, I mean, I've shown my age now, I was in secondary school and we were sharing exercise books between us, and at that point um, they were sending some secondary schools to become grant maintained, Yes. and they were trying to adjust and rebuild particularly where nice to quite tight in many areas. Well, this is a yes, okay. I apologize. Uh, Austerity, yeah. like now. Sorry. Just Austerity, like now. Austerity, just like yeah. now. Yes. The, during the Depression, the states they built the best stations. Yes, that's right. Quite... Sorry. So, yeah. it, I mean, it's an interesting question. Why did the bill, bill fail? And, and uh, to be honest, I think there's a lot more research needs to be done on it. I mean, it, but uh, the particularly interesting thing was. It fell because of the almost across the board hostility of London MPs. There was very little gratitude for the project. There was a lot of resistance, a lot of nimbyism. It's like HS2. Anybody who was remotely near the line of the project saw it as a threat. It was concerned particularly about the dangers of tunnelling a mainline railway under London. So uh, let's let's. Can bring, bring the story forwards. What then has brought Crossrail back onto the statute book? What has taken it through to implementation? Undoubtedly, it's been the Docklands. The Docklands have been the driver of change. Uh, it's worth remembering that the Docks was a port area and it had no transport infrastructure. It had the river. That was its transport infrastructure and freight railway lines. But... Um, that was the situation in 1980. By the time the London Docklands Development Corporation had been wound up in 2000, that was the legacy that they had left with the Jubilee Line running through here. But already, as we've seen, that was insufficient. The concentration of 150,000 jobs here on the Isle of Dogs generates a level of demand which, interestingly, they never foresaw because they imagined that 50% of this workforce would travel by road. But very far from it, 90% of them travelled by public transport. So the 
Actually, Dawkins has got a, a very generous road infrastructure which lies idle even at peak hours. A 10 lane dual, you know, multi, multi lane carriageway which you could sit in the middle of even at rush hour. Um, so all the demand is on the rails, and that is a demand which it was recognised would need to, would, would require new investment. And so consequently, when Mayor Ken Livingstone wrote his London plan in 2004, he envisaged new heavy rail investment under London, a cross rail scheme linking together the West End, the city and the doctors in what he called a virtual, unified, economic and business core. So, we now come to the last lap of the initial project planning phase. In 2003, the Department of Transport set up what it called Cross London Rail Links, which is a partnership between itself, Transport for London and the Strategic Rail Authority who were the successors of British Rail. Olympia and York successfully lobbied for the alignment to go through the Isle of Dogs and to serve Canary Wharf. The scheme, modified now, no longer to run from Liverpool Street but to come through Canary Wharf, was submitted as the Crossrail Bill. Three and a half years of petitioning, debate and scrutiny and a design review for stakeholders which I chaired so I was involved with Crossrail at this stage. And there was a meticulous environmental impact assessment as well as an extended process of scrutiny through a, private com through a parliamentary committee. This time, the bill got through. 2008, Royal Assent. So the Queen signs off the project. That's the end of the story, or is it? Crossrail was launched in May, the construction phase, by Prime Minister Gordon Cameron and Mayor Boris Johnson. But here we come again to your looking at the macroeconomy. May 2009 was not the best moment to be launching a major rail construction project. Um, there were many, many doubters. Many people felt that the project shouldn't go ahead. This was not the right place or the right time to be spending £16 billion on a, on a, there's, sorry, there's a six missing there, uh, on, on, on a, a new railway in London, which already had the enormous investment of the Jubilee Line. Nevertheless, in 2010, the October Comprehensive Spending Review confirmed that Crossrail was value for money. Sorry, these are all shifted. And in May 2011, the tunnelling contracts were signed. And effectively, it was only then, only the May before last, that you could say the lights were green and Crossrail was definitely going to happen when they'd signed the tunnelling contracts. It could have been, and many argued it should have been, stopped at any stage before then. So, Let's look at the project which is now going ahead full scheme. Here we have the um, Old Oak um, portal just west of Paddington and the two bore holes into which the tunnel boring machines have now penetrated. And um, all across London we have the station excavations, the ventilating shafts, the grouting shafts which are put there to dampen vibrations. You, you dig a, um, you drill a hole and then you go out horizontally from it and you spread uh, a sort of dendritic network of concrete which stabilises vibrations coming up through the subsoil. Here, for example, at Finsbury Circus in London, this charming square to the north of the city of London, with its bowling greens and its tennis courts and its mature plane trees, has become, you can't really see it, uh, an, an enormous construction site. Um, and so it is wherever we go. 
uh, major road closures and diversions. Here we are at Eastbourne Terrace. This used to be a major bus route and a major transport route. It's where you can go to Paddington and uh, get off the bus or take your taxi when you were going westwards on, on the train. Now, a huge construction site. Many people are working on construction of these tunnels. Last September, we uh, launched, or rather, the Prime Minister launched, Chuka, the Tunnelling and Underground Construction Academy in Ilford in London. And there's a conscious attempt to try and gear the labour market towards the requirements of this huge construction project. And at this moment, there are five TBMs, five tunnel boring machines, these gigantic heronknecht moles um, built in the Black Forest, uh, grinding their way. And there's a wonderful um, website where you can track the progress of these great machines under the map of London. Uh, there are lots of inter intersections between crossrail tunnels and excavations with the earlier infrastructures of underground London. Um, for example, where ticket halls are being joined at Tottenham Court Road, the huge hole in the road under centre point is where a new ticket hall for Crossrail is combining with the existing ticket hall uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of the Northern Line and, and the Central Line. Reutilisation of earlier tunnels, for example, under the Royal Docks, where an old railway line has been refurbished to carry the Woolwich branch of the Crossrail route. Or here in the Kingsway Tram Tunnel, one of the old tram tunnels of London, near the London School of Economics, where this piece of empty infrastructure is being used as a site to drill down a grout injection shaft. And in all of this, we can see the civil engineering as a great media spectacle. Uh, there are lots of, if you go to the website, it's quite wonderful. Uh, lots of what you call double-decker bus statistics or distance to the moon statistics. Um, simply to try and bring out the scale and ambitiousness of the project. And there are wonderful time-lapse webcams, construction videos, wonderful bird's-eye flyovers, and so on and so on. Uh, as well as this near you mapping tool, which enables you to track the progress of the tunnel boring machines day by day under the city. Do you teach mega projects as media spectacles? No. It's a very interesting dimension. It is. To do with the PR and the presentation and the creating public enthusiasm. Yeah. Okay. Now, what I want to do just in the remaining time is talk about. What this, how this railway fits into the texture of London. And here's where my keyhole surgery comes in. You see, on the one hand, yes, it's a mega project. It's expected to carry 200 million passengers a year, real estate portfolio, two and a half million square feet, estimate value of 1.6 billion, total property uplift estimated at five and a half billion, Lots of public rail, rail improvements. We did a, a special issue of the journal Built Environment, all about railway station mega projects and the remaking of inner cities in Europe. So this fits as a bigger, as part of the bigger narrative of what's happening in Zurich, what's happening in Frankfurt, what's happening in Stuttgart, what's happening in Amsterdam, what's happening in Berlin. You can see this rail investment as part of a bigger story. On the other hand, my paper in this special issue is saying, yes, but in all the other cases, the opportunity is being used to maximise the urban development around the railway stations. Crossrail is different. Crossrail is designed to minimise environmental impact, minimise the disruption of the urban fabric. It's in this way that the project is keyhole surgery. It's open chest, but yet everything is going to be put back, and so you would hardly know it was there. For example, for, for example, Southampton Road. There's a very major ventilation shaft going in behind 
a listed building in Southampton Road. 1910 commercial offices just north of Hope and Tube Station. You see the frontage there. Behind it is this great new installation of a ventilation shaft and fire escape room. But it's tucked away secretly, cleverly, subtly, in such a way that uh, you would never know. Now, so what I want to do uh, for, for the remaining time is just take us on a, on a, a, a transept west to east, looking at the railway stations for Crossrail to show you how they've been fitted into the urban fabric. So here we've got Paddington. Paddington Station, Eastbourne Terrace, Parade Street, Sussex Gardens, the Park, Lancaster Gate. And here you've got a ventilation shaft. And the station is neatly tucked in on the site of the old taxi rank. So essentially the only visible change would be the fact that there's a glass box now where the old taxi rank was and everything else will be reinstated to the status quo ante. Or Bond Street Station, where two 1960s office blocks, both of them fairly undistinguished buildings, have been removed. One just behind Bond Street Station, the other, rather strangely, on Hanover Square. So remember, this is the typical pattern of Crossrail. You've got these trains which are 253 metres long, or whatever it is, something like that, and the station entrances are generally at either end of the platforms. So instead of having one single large station, generally the, the impact has been diffused by splitting the passenger flow between two exits. But of course the strange thing here is that this is going to be called Bond Street, but it's actually much closer to Oxford Circus. Here you've got Regent Street coming down. And um, uh, of course it seems like a bigger excavation at present because that building on Hanover Square, the building is gone, here's the London Library, Actually, what you've got is a much larger uh, construction site with hoardings around it and the road blocked off. But actually, when it's all put back together again, what you'll have is a building fabric which is much the same in volume to that which there was before the demolition started. Or well, here we are moving next stop along at Tottenham Court Road. Uh, along another north-south, long, narrow block in Soho. This involved the biggest loss of historic buildings. This is a very historic, early 18th century fabric, this street grid of Soho. And then behind Soho Square, here's the Catholic Church. Here's the funny little half-timbered kiosk in the middle of the square. Here's the site of the Apollo nightclub. Um, and here's centre point. Um, and that's uh, the, the, you know, the largest cluster of buildings that are being removed. And they're being removed to create underneath Charing Cross Road this enormous new ticket hall, which will open out on the other side underneath centre point. So the escalators will come up and will we'll be in a new piazza, which will be a very convenient walking distance for us here. Um, so the trip to Heathrow, or the trip back home to Essex, will be um, yeah, jump on the train and you're off to Shedfield in, uh, in, in um, 20 minutes flat. It will be wonderful actually, really, really will. So here you've got the what's happening underground, the two tubes, the two, two lines of the, of the train, and these one, two, three, uh, oversight developments, a ticket hall underneath there, new commercial opportunity but quite confined, and then a new ticket hall emerging with entrances emerging under the feet of centre point. Now this is the most difficult one. Here we've got Crossrail coming through. It intersects at Farringdon with Thameslink which is the north-south 
through train line. So in terms of Paris, this is Châtelet Les Halles. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of London, this is two small stations which have been fitted in real keyhole surgery on Farringdon Road by Cowcross Street and at the far end of the Smithfield Meat Market, just in between Charterhouse and Bart's Hospital, surrounded by conservation areas, heavily hedged around by the constraints of working in the historic fabric of London. And again, a rather surprising approach to what is the maximum point of accessibility in the whole transport system of London. This is going to be a really big station, but it's not being designed as a big station, it's being designed as two rat holes um, uh, on either end of the platform. What is the, the uh, London Underground uh, uh, station to the right now? Uh, is that Barbican? That's Barbican. That's Barbican. That's Barbican. Yeah, that's two different, two different That's the Hammersmith and City Line coming round to Barbican. Yeah. That's right. And that's that amazing, uh, I mean, there, there you can see the tracks, and that's that fantastic flat iron building, mm. which has had its um, nose nipped off. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary, I mean, really, you know, it, it shut, uh, Le, Le Al, they pulled down the market in order to build the station. It's very controversial, but they did. Um, we have, we've still got the meat lorries. Anybody not been to see Smithfield Market? You Chinese, have you seen Smithfield Market? You must visit this extraordinary, it's the big wholesale meat market, right in the middle of the city. And the big trucks with the meat are coming from Ireland and Scotland and Know, all over Europe, and now they'll just be coming in. So this is very strange that, I mean, it's the last of the functioning wholesale markets, and the project has been designed around them. Uh, Finsbury Circus, here's the circus I showed you before. This is Moorgate uh, Underground Station. This is Liverpool Street. This is going to be called Liverpool Street Station. In fact, that's actually a long way from Liverpool Street. And even this, it's actually, the, 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 uh, there was a very long escalator which uh, then brings you out into the concourse in front of Liverpool Street Station. So it's a far from seamless um, insertion there. Um, Whitechapel, well I could say more about that, let's just go on. And let's, let's end off with Canary Wharf. Now, Crossrail is only happening because of Canary Wharf because of this great private estate, which has grown so spectacularly, and which was originally to be served only by this little Docklands light railway. Well, that's why it went bust, because it wasn't sufficient. It, well, well, indeed, yes, it wasn't sufficient. And so, consequently, stage two was the insertion of the Jubilee line, and nor is that sufficient to meet with demand. It's amazing. If you go to the Jubilee Line station, again, if you haven't seen it, it is the most beautiful station in Europe. But go to Russia, and then you will realise that these monumental spaces are already full to capacity. So, station number one, station number two, and then station number three, coming into the north of the project, all connected by underground shopping malls, but not an integrated station, a triangulation of three distinct stations linked together by a retail now. I mean, it could work very well. Um, and here we've got the aerial view, wonderful aerial shot from the website, of the Crossrail located in the what was the old import dock of the West India Docks at the foot of the HSBC building and Canada Tower. And then, job done, the graduates of the Tunnelling and Underground Construction Academy can turn their hands to the upgrading of the rest of the underground network. So that's the mega project. And there it is, inserting into the 
railway map of London, as it will look when the trains start to run in 2017. Thank you very much. Thank you. at the end uh, uh, the economic approach that the, how Crocker has been developed uh, to try not to interfere much with the uh, London heritage but uh, I would say it is my personal view that such a big project could actually be implemented in a, in a different way or even though uh, if we have Crocker 2 now uh, that uh, try to, to do a different approach to, to have uh, oversight development and, and uh, private inver in inversion in the project. It could have been if we had a different political system, but we don't. I mean, London, it's very important to realise, is a two-tier system of government. London boroughs are very strong, um, and they are the primary planning authorities. And uh, they didn't want that they didn't want to assemble land. Many of the stations are on the boundaries between two, one or more borough. For example, Tottenham Court Road is on the boundary between Westminster and Camden. Um, Farringdon is on the boundary between Islington and... Um, did you have little dotted lines in your, uh, in your map? Yes, I probably did. Boundaries. We showed the boundaries. Yes. And, you know, talking to, to the borough leaders, they, they, they felt the crossroads should respect the prevailing planning philosophy, which is, in most of London, to maintain a, a, you know, a livable scale, five-storey, six-storey buildings. They, and and the, the urban tissue of London is one in which, um, a, apart from certain sites around the centre, such as King's Cross, Canary Wharf, Paddington Basin, We've resisted large-scale commercial development. So you could say that it, it, it's been a conservative planning philosophy, um, but it's had a very long history, and, and it's been inscribed in planning policy that we protect the, a more domestic and traditional scale of urban development outside the central business district. So. All you can say is the crossrail has been fitted in in accordance with that philosophy. That, that's a quintessentially English philosophy, isn't it? Yes. I mean, we, I mean, we do it more in, in, the, in, in England than anywhere else in Europe. And if you go to Oxford, for example, you find exactly the same thing happening. Uh, uh, new buildings inserted within ancient uh, medieval uh, 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 locales uh, and you don't, you don't. See, it's, the new building does not dominate the uh, the old area that's, that was already there. Yes. So, um, when I was involved in the future station design, um, a couple of years ago now, one of the things that was particularly heavy was in investigating was passenger flight. Once off the train, how do you best direct? <laughs> Um, one thing I'd be interested to know, particularly around the Farringdon, which in Essex we now is actually found that is going to be the core station for every major airport mm -hmm. and every um, major dock link as well, yeah. in, of actually linking up to Dover, Southampton, mm -hmm. um, and Harwich, Felix. So, how was that passenger flow actually looked at, and was it at, was it? either a case of looking at what well, this exists and we might try and get them out into the existing, or was it a case of we've, these are going to be the two points that actually we're going to be pushing that into and we may have to look at other infrastructure changes to accommodate the fact that we're pushing out. Well, the fact that Farringdon has been very much criticised because in fact some of the transfer, some of the important flows haven't been designed for. You have to come out of the Crossrail station and go across Cowcross Street and down onto the Metropolitan Line platforms, for example. Um, again, but it's partly because the Farringdon station is a listed station. It's one of the original termini of the 
of the, uh, of the, of the metropolitan line. So conservation considerations have played a very significant part. It's a conservation area, there are listed buildings, and I mean, from a functional point of view, an imperfect solution has been shoehorned in. Um, of course, it may change. It may, it, it may well be that actually the meat market moves. It may well be that Farringdon becomes a development site in the fullness of time. It may well be that um, you know, the whole uh, possibilities of large-scale redevelopment in that area uh, shift as a result of decisions by the city corporation and the, and, the, and the meat market. But at the time of design, that wasn't the case. The fact that you said that Crossrail was meant to minimise urban development really fascinates me. Because for something of this scale, then for something that is so expensive, you would expect a much bigger return than it's projected to deliver. The figures that have been released show a £5.5 billion pound increase in property values, which sounds a lot, but when compared to the Jubilee Land extension, for example, where you have £2 billion pounds alone for the Mary Wall, £800 billion pounds for Southwark Station alone, doesn't seem that much in comparison. Secondly, most... Well, hold on, just, I mean, just sure. on, on that. I mean, it's partly because the, um, the scheme has been drawn very tightly. So I think a lot of these estimates are <coughs> based on the oversight development, the actual property portfolio, which has been minimised for the reasons that we, you know, come back to our friend here. They haven't assembled large sites around the, around the railheads. Um, I mean, in actual fact, the, the, the longer term impact on the distribution of land values in London, I think is, is likely to be much bigger than that. I haven't read the GVA study. I'm taking, simply taking that figure from the Crossrail website and from their briefing sheet. I mean, it'd be interesting to know I'm sure that you know you can redo the sums based on um, you know, a, a second and third round impacts of the enhanced accessibility, particularly at the east side of, of London, and you come up with a much bigger figure. This is very much an art. I mean, you know, we, 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 we revere figures, but these figures are. Very, I mean, better or for worse. They're yes. very much in their infancy as to how they're calculated, which is why they've been left out up until very recently, agglomeration benefits. So, um, you know, I agree that they might likely to be in that underestimate because we haven't lost the arts on that, that, that area. Uh, but, but, again, but again, the whole thing is, is because of the British uh, political system. Uh, it's because the British political system is innately conservative. Uh, and, and resistant to, to major changes. If you put this in in, 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 uh, in Spain, in China, in, 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 in Germany, uh, it would go through with, with huge changes, or in France too. Uh, in Austria, in Britain, it doesn't happen. Both Austria and Britain are against destroying uh, the old, uh, what, what, what was already there, and they're prepared to to, to prevent that destruction, even though it is costing them an enormous amount of, uh, of uh, opportunity money. Second, so can I build on that? And although we spent a lot of time talking about how this is keyhole surgery in the centre of London, a lot of the property development case, especially on the Crossroad website, the official plans, mm. have shown huge developments to be happening further out along the line. True. Ian and Broadway, Abbey Wood, for example, mm, yes. huge developments to be happening. However, Aside from up the Abbey Wood branch, these rural stations exist already. It's not like the Jubilee Line extension where you are putting public transport into an area that previously didn't have rail transport. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And especially towards Maidenhead, there is not particularly much of a capacity increase. The greatest of Maidenhead already received six trains an hour. Mm. That's true. I mean, the real, the real benefit will come when it connects with Reading, mm -hmm. um, but that isn't part of the, of the present scheme. I'm sure it'll happen eventually. Just psychologically, what might be the big, I mean, how much benefit would there be to being able to get on a direct train to central London as opposed to just having to? Well, John, 
Uh, I think John, then you're next. Um, in answer to your question, um, there's another problem in, in that London Transport seem to use, um, London Underground, I should say, tend to use a very old pedestrian flow model called Pedroot, which is actually based on a concept developed in the 1970s. Um, there are rather more modern pedestrian flow model, which I think they need to use, um, particularly not just for normal operations, but actually for emergency evacuation flow model. And I don't know whether they do that or not. Uh, I assume they must be. Um, what I was going to say is that it's not just keyhole surgery off the ground. Uh, I was at um, Centre Point this morning at the Tottenham Court Road upgrade. And it is absolutely keyhole surgery below ground. The stuff they're actually trying to fit in the stuff around these enormous in the underground infrastructure, some of which, the location of which is not known. And in fact, unfortunately, three years ago, four years ago, um, a guy was actually killed because they struck uh, an unknown cable, which actually blew up mm. and, and, and killed him. Mm. Um, and, and, and so yes, it's as much a problem below as it is. Yes, yes, I'm sure it is. Yeah, that's right. Yes. And part of what they're doing also is to piggyback on Crossrail upgrades of a lot of the utilities and services underneath the ground, the, the sewerage, the electric cables, the telecoms and, and so on. Yes. Yes. I know all the answers to all of them actually. Uh, I mean, I don't know what, in what sense it's the biggest one in Europe. That again is one of these travel to the moon statistics that uh, appears on the website. But uh, no, it, is, it is a large project by any standards. Um, I don't know the current estimate of the cost benefit ratio. And the funding is, is a mixture of, um, uh, of, 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 of treasury. Mayor of London, um, the uh, National Rail um, uh, Is Authority, there a private sector and then uh, some private sector contributions, particularly from Canary Wharf, uh, just as they did for the Jubilee Line. Um, and then this is for the construction phase, and then the project will be leased, obviously, to a railway operating company. At the, at the running phase. So there was a supplemental business rates. A supplemental business rates, that's right, which the Mayor of London has, has brought in. Yes, that's right. So there's a contribution from the... There's a land levy. Levy? Levy? An infrastructure levy, is there not? Yes, 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 there is. It's, 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 it's manifested in the form of supplemental business rates. Yeah. Right. And that will only affect the properties around the station, along the line, or is it across London? Good question. Again, I'm not sure. I think it's cast quite wide, which has caused some actual um, controversy. That people say, "Well, it, yeah. what benefit are we going to get from Crossrail?" Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, I actually been to be nasty to Section 106 agreements. Yes. <laughs> oh no, that I, I don't touch them. Work. As, is Crossrail subject to being funded by any Section 106 agreements that pre-existed? Do you know? No. <laughs> and, Good question. And, and actually, do we expect in that case any future developments? 
yes. may be subject to section 106, i.e. in order to build your building you have to fund an additional entrance into the flow they might actually try and get some additional money back for future development. Mm -hmm. I, that I did. So I think you might have a politician yes. there, I shouldn't do it. Yeah, I don't know, it's kind of a technical question with economic, but it's very simple. It's a, uh, has been um, um, considered at some point an upgrade of growth rail. I, I understand that the trains are single deck. Uh, in in our uh, places in Europe, they use a double decker uh, train for this kind of. Uh, uh, mm. They're talking about double decker trains, aren't they? It's yes. just too small. The bore is just too small to to manage the double decker trains. Unless you build some completely new double decker trains, which have not yet been conceived, but it but it, it can't do what the RER can do. The gauge is too small. Yeah. The reason they didn't do double deck was because the existing height of lines within the UK is such that we can't take double decks in the UK, particularly in the line of the Liverpool Street. Uh, yeah. Because they considered it a gift <coughs> And they actually turned it down at, um, prior to issuing the PQQ for the train build. And that's when they said, no, we won't go double deck on this build at all. We won't even look at it. Yeah. And that's why they went wrong. But the other part of it was that the egress and ingress on board a train is quicker when it's single deck. Yes. With twelve much with longer trains. Um, so the dwell time on the double decker trains on the REL system, for example, is uh, is almost double the uh, the dwell time on the uh, on line uh, uh, on line uh, line A. Um, they've had to extend the, 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 that, that dwell time as they've introduced double-deckers into, into line A uh, this year, or last year. Can I just add that in Japan, they very rarely use double-deckers on commuter services. Going on Tokyo suburban lines, it is an odd sight to see a 15-carriage train that's single-decker, with the first-class carriages being double-decker. But then, for exactly that reason, Mm. It's just not fast can, can, I, can I interject here? Um, because it is a common characteristic with mega projects for us to applaud, criticise, expand on the detailed engineering, logistic, equipment, innovation. Uh, and that's all good. Don't misunderstand me. But what in so doing is overlooked is the impact on urban structure, strategic development, yeah. lifestyle changes, um, innovation, um, and this, all, all I'm really trying to do here is to redress the discussion a little bit, because um, from our research in the other sector, there's no doubt about it that the, the expertise, and, and you know my, my origin is, is not English, but the expertise of what Britain has brought to bear is absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but fun enough for a country that has a tradition in leading urban planning, strategic thinking, that linkage is not so weak, uh, strong, despite some individual people um, arguing this particular. So that's just one point. I mean, I just want us to redress. Otherwise, we get too we, we get too absorbed. Um, and, and also, just very quickly, like to link some of our findings at the Omnibus Centre with um, this project and then maybe might you could just comment back to any yeah. of them that may, uh, may strike you as significant. Um, in the Omnibus Centre we retrospectively looked at 30 projects internationally, um, mega projects of which some were rail projects. Um, and we looked at the decision making in order to understand better how decisions were made and ultimately to come to some kind of judgment as to how you succeed, whether projects are successes or not. And cost-benefit ratios were mentioned, technological innovation was mentioned, architectural styles were mentioned. But you know, at the end of the day, what is a successful, you know, how do you judge this as a successful project or a failure? Anyway, um, one of the looking back on projects, and it would be very interesting to do it for the Crossrail, is that 
there, there are planetary alignments, there are circumstances when opportunities arise that politicians and economies, and they just, you have to do the project now or you don't do the project now. So um, what these planetary alignments are, I mean, it can be, it can be polit political leadership and champions mm -hmm. who are in place, who can make things happen. Mm -hmm. And that's why if you don't do it when that champ is there, then you're not going to have it done. Or it could be that there's an economic downturn, which, anyway, there are planetary alignments which can post-rationalize why things stop. And, and, and it's, a, it's important for strategic thinking to learn the lessons of how to recognize planetary alignments. Um, mm. The second is to differentiate between what we've called mega projects on steroids and mega projects on drip feeding. Um, yeah, the Olympic Games is very much a mega project on steroids. Yeah. It has to be done uh, and come what may, you know. Uh, and, and there are projects which are done in bits and pieces. We're pretty good at that in England, or have been up until recently anyway. Um, <coughs> stop and start. We've already mentioned the political leadership issue, and it would know, be very interesting to see, to track um, the, the uh, the political leadership sort of history to this one. Um, I mean, there's no doubt about it, CTRL benefited from Heseltine and, and ben benefited from Prescott and disbenefited from Faulkner taking over the, the, uh, um, the, the, the gateway urban regeneration that was supposed to, supposed to follow. Um, an interesting approach to, to judging whether it's success or failure. I don't personally follow it, but it's still a, a, a point. How many hospitals do you build with this? How many universities? How many, how many other things? You know, and, and um, it, it can be quite stark if you put it, but then the next thing is the short run, the long run. So what are the long run um, benefits um, to this going into strategic thinking, going into agent of change ambitions that we may have. This is where another, uh, which is no surprise to people around this table, I'm sure, this is where the cost-benefit ratio is absolute nonsense, because he doesn't pick up any of this. And 80, was it 84, John, or was it 87% of those interviewed of international experts, infrastructure experts? It's about 84%. 84% yeah. of those interviewed said that you know, cost-benefit analysis is inappropriate for large-scale projects. It's not that it's not important. It doesn't tell the whole story. Um, and so this is one reason why lumping up hospitals or schools as alternative opportunity costs. Um, but there is no, no doubt about it that the, I mean, the construction capabilities that the British industry has, I, mean, I think, despite my criticism a moment ago, I mean, it really is, uh, this is, but of course that's also true elsewhere because it's going to go to France, so I shouldn't push that one too much. Then you've got, I'd, I'd be interested in your view on this, you've got My Michael Adams's point. It's, hang on guys, this is all feeding hypermobility. The, the premise is the further you travel, the faster you go, the more economic growth you've got, and therefore better. And actually it ain't like that. Have we subjected this to a sustainability? appraisal in terms of what, what are the benefits. I suspect this might come out actually much higher than some other projects. Um, and is it going to be the equity issue? If you're in Brazil, um, there was no way they're going to have price structuring that they have here. So context matters. And then Delhi also, you build this project and then you bar the people by price. But we seem to manage it quite well here. Um, the property uplift one is, is where up until recently, up until the last decade or so, there, there was thoughts of getting their money back. But if you don't have a mechanism, it's like the big dig, if you don't have the mechanisms in place, and we're only just beginning to get it in place, then the people who profit, the land speculators, who can survive the dips and the, um, uh, so it's a matter of surviving the dips and the troughs and the, and, and the peaks, and then they are ultimately only a few. Um, I'm almost finished. 
Then there's the, going back, it, well, it's not my, it, it's uh, something that came out from our research, but I think Mike Adams would recognize this, is the other concept of mega projects spawning mega projects. And then you then lose the scale of, of, of city development, and but uh, whether it's CTRL spawning Olympic Games, you know, what is what other mega projects is this going to spawn? Um, yeah, I know there's enough there, I'm sure. Um, but they're, they're the kind of the resonance that, and some comments. I don't know if you'd like to pick up, up on any of those. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that in terms of a great city, an underground railway of high capacity, high frequency, is a remarkable form of investment. It, it's, it's one which articulates the space of the city. It brings together, it enlarges the city it, in terms of the functional connection of east and west and, and north and south. Um, and it, in, it enlarges the opportunity potential of residents in the city. Um, in, in dramatic ways, which are quite unpredictable. Um, and it's got a flexibility which equivalent road investment would not have. So, I mean, by sort of the case for Crossrail, I think it was very well made in the parliamentary process in which the arguments about um, the, um, you know, the, the, the connection between east and west and, and the, uh, the cementing of this Dockens business centre, which grew up adventitiously, which wasn't planned, mm -hmm. grew up by accident, because somebody decided to put a, um, a dealing floor in the banana shed, which had originally been intended for a back office um, computer. I mean, so Canary Wharf and, and all of that was, is, is a very a sort of unexpected, unplanned opportunity for London, and the, the, the Jubilee Line first, and now Crossrail, is part of the reordering of the infrastructure to really make sense of that eastern expansion slot and tie it into the larger structure of the city. So that, I think, is the, is the case. And on that note, I yeah. thank you all very much. Sorry, can I ask yeah. one very, very quick question? Within DLR and Jubilee extension, we've seen that actually the accessibility that's put in for disabled people is actually not the uh, because of too small, uh, too long walkways, very little opportunity for egress, ingress to where people want to go. Do you think Crossrail might have actually future proofed itself this time? I hope it has. I mean, it was definitely, it was a factory in the design phase from from day one, and it's something which has not, I think, been, a lot of the ideas that have been value engineered out, but I don't think the disabled access has, so, well, to be, to be seen, but, uh, I don't know. I mean, if you should, this is where you should talk to their, to their PR people, and they would do a better job than I have. Oh, and Mike, thanks, I think we will call it, can I ask, because I can answer that question. Oh, all right. Well, I can do it if you like. I, I know that the, uh, the CEO, Andrew Wilson, uh, has got the lady that he meets uh, from the disability uh, or disabled uh, community uh, who gives him advice on actually how their plans are going in terms of suiting their needs. So it's something that's very, you know, just randomly mentioned the other day. It's very much top of mind for it. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll drop it. Uh, Mike, thanks once, once again for a very penetrating insight into that. Thank you.